is in your hands. You've made our previous films incredible successes. I'm counting on you now. So again, InfoWars.com to get the DVD or call toll free 888-253-3139 or see them all in incredible high quality at PrisonPlanet.tv. The ball is in your court. PrisonPlanet.tv is a better tool than ever in the info war. Over six years of my radio and TV shows, all my films in super high quality, my book, Paul Watson's book, all there, 15 cents a day. Your support of PrisonPlanet.tv empowers the resistance to unlock minds worldwide. In all of the British dependencies, these organizations, the front groups, were called the Royal Institute for International Affairs. In the United States, they chose a different name. They chose the Council on Foreign Relations, but it held exactly the same relationship to this inner society of uh, Cecil Rhodes. Among the charter members were W. Averill Harriman of Union Banking, then President of the United States, Woodrow Wilson's main advisor, Colonel Edward Mendel House, John D. Rockefeller, the founder of Standard Oil, banking mogul J.P. Morgan, and prominent bankster Paul Warburg. Well, the Council on Foreign Relations exists today. It's probably the most powerful single organization in America. Many uh, observers, including myself, believe that it is the hidden uh, government of the United States. These people are not elected to office, and most uh, Americans don't even know who they are. Um, but they are holding all of the important positions in society. There are only about 4,000 of them in the United States, but I don't care what organization you want to look at, whether it's government or whether it's the universities or the large media centers or whatever it is, you look at the people at the tops of those organizations, the owners, the managers, the CEOs, the board of directors, and I'm going to say probably 80 to 90 percent of the great power centers of America are dominated by just those 4,000 people who are members of the Council on Foreign Relations. Throughout its history, it would contain extremely influential and powerful individuals in finance, business, media, and politics. Former presidents of the United States include Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, and William Jefferson Clinton. Currently, Barack Obama claims not to be a member, but has spoken in front of the council and has had his writings published in the council's magazine, Foreign Affairs. It's been reported that um, you and your wife are in the globalist CFR, which is a council on foreign relations. And I'd like to know if that is true. Well, first of all, uh, I'm, I'm not... Uh, the, the council on foreign relations... Uh, I don't know if I'm a official member. I have sp I've spoken there before. Uh, it basically is just a forum where a bunch of people talk about foreign policy. Uh, and so there's nothing, uh, there, there's no official membership. I don't have a card or, you know, a special handshake or anything like that. Now, why is that important? It's important because the avowed purpose of the Council on Foreign Relations is to create a new world order, a global government based on the model of collectivism. And that includes the elimination of the United States as a sovereign nation. That's why it's important. The people running this country are determined to destroy it. The council was heavily criticized during the 1980s for being an organization hell-bent on destroying national sovereignty in favor of a world government. So many of its members hid their association with the organization. Dick Cheney had this to say in response to a question by David Rockefeller, who became the CFR's youngest director in 1949 and was chairman of the board from 1970 to 1985. He remains an honorary chairman to this day. It's good to be back at the Council on Foreign Relations, as uh, Pete mentioned. I been a member for a long time and was actually a director for some period of time. I never mentioned that when I was campaigning for re-election back home in Wyoming. Now, you are the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, all right? Yes, sir. You guys toy with the uh, with countries of the world like, uh, like, well, like toys, don't you? You're like the Illuminati. You're the Masons. You control everything, don't you? That's the rap on you guys. 
What's so interesting now, though, is well, who's on the chessboard. It's the toys, if you will, are a lot more than states. Notice that Mr. Haas does not deny that the CFR has massive control over the geopolitical arena and instead tries to focus on the separate entities outside of nation states. Current Secretary of State Hillary Clinton also reveals the importance of the CFR here. Uh, but it's good to have an outpost of the council right here down the street from the State Department. Uh, we get a lot of advice from the council, so this will mean I won't have this far to go to uh, be told uh, what we should be doing and uh, how uh, we should uh, think about the future. You have these private groups that are run and created by the elite, uh, by the ultra-rich, wealthy families that have been manipulating global markets from behind the scenes for generations. They create these private groups that then feed information to the government, to senators, to congressmen, their recommendations, their policy papers, what they think should happen. And it's fascinating because if you actually read what it is that they're doing, uh, the recommendations that they make, they're very able to get them put in place. Discussions that are going on in these private groups are really talks that should be going on in Senate committees and in the halls of Congress, but they're happening with these ultra-elite groups that are then pushing their propaganda into the political mainstream, and then it's becoming enacted, it's becoming put into law. Still not convinced the CFR is promoting a new world order? Listen to what Leslie Gelb had to say upon leaving the New York Times to chair the organization as its president in 1993. Uh, I loved it. Doing a column is a great job. I'm going to an equally great but different job, and in a, in a way a job that, that caps everything I've been doing in my life, in government, and academia, and in journalism. Uh, I think that's what the, the Council on Foreign Relations will allow me to do. Well, you know, for example, uh, you had me and uh, three or four other folks on this show a few months ago Apparently to House talk about or... the New World Order, right? Right, exactly. Right? Bob and I talk about it, right. exactly. I talk about it all the time. New World Order wants a global system where one small central authority of individuals can then dictate a policy that's going to be distributed down to the rest of the world, everywhere, in the smallest little town in the middle of nowhere in, in some remote country. I now think it's safe to say that the Council is extremely influential on the world stage and openly promote global governance. The Council and the globalists were able to take this agenda to the next level following World War II. The United Nations was born out of the ashes of this conflict. Unlike the League of Nations, the United States not only joined this organization, they championed it. The first book I wrote was uh, The Fearful Master, A Second Look at the United Nations. It was written at a time when it was not popular to be critical of the UN. I mean, the United Nations was viewed by almost everybody as our last best hope for peace. It was a means, we were told, to bring humanity together and put an end to war and live in peace and harmony and promote trade and all of these good things. I wish it were any of those things, but it's not. The original charter for the United Nations was drafted in San Francisco in 1945 and the United States became a permanent member of the Security Council, along with France, the United Kingdom, the Soviet Union, and the Republic of China. The process by which other nations' belief systems could be used to erode and eviscerate our Constitution and Bill of Rights had taken a giant leap forward. The United Nations is one of the most well-known sort of globalization attempts. Its primary goal is to streamline all the governments of the world, to create a global council, and to unify all the rules and all the regulations for the world. So it's essentially the precursor uh, in an engine of this new world order. The United Nations is made up of all of the countries of the world, most of which are dictatorships of one kind or another. And you don't take a bunch of dictatorships and put them into a bag and shake it up and come out with a a freedom-loving uh, governmental unit. You come out with a global dictatorship. This was the public base of global governance. However, many other organizations have been birthed since. 
Even more suspect is a private group called the Trilateral Commission. David Rockefeller and Henry Kissinger are among its some 300 influential members. The Trilateral Commission, rich in powerful business and political leaders from Japan, Europe, and North America, the New York-based policy group was formed in 1973 by Chase Manhattan Bank Chairman David Rockefeller. In addition to Rockefeller, there are many other noted American members. Among them, economist Alan Greenspan, former Defense Secretary Harold Brown. George Bush was once a member, but resigned last year before his unsuccessful presidential campaign. Back then, it wasn't politically wise to be aligned with what his party's right wing considered a shadow world government. The United Nations would take over America. The Trilateral Commission would control the world. Just look at its membership, they say. Current and former members include Presidents Clinton, Bush, and Carter. Names like Brzezinski, Christopher, Kissinger, and Schultz. And top executives of ITT, Xerox, Exxon, and Nations Bank. Although this group with only 300 members seems to be at the apex of the power structure, there is yet another group formed in 1954 that is even smaller in number and has a greater influence on world events. Meet the Bilderberg Group. This elite group meet annually around the globe. There is a core group of members who have attended every year for decades, such as David Rockefeller, Henry Kissinger, and Queen Beatrix of the Netherlands. These members invite others who are politically and socially relevant at the time. Each year, around 140 people are in attendance. Tell me the truth. I did, all I did was go. They had a, a Republican and a Democrat. Republican. I gave I gave like a 20 minute call call to all the presidents. Did you have any idea who would be in John Kerry's running mate? Or did you talk about that? No, because I wasn't his running mate. I happened to be in Europe then on my way to Russia. I was invited to go to Bilderberg by Bernard Jordan, a friend of mine, and a genuine hero of the civil rights movement. And to the best of my knowledge, NAFTA was not discussed by anybody in my presence. Documents released by the group in 2001 reveal that in September of 1955, the group met in Germany and covertly outlined the idea of a European Union. Section E, European Unity, discusses the general support for European integration and unification and the idea to unify Germany once again with the rest of Europe under a common marketplace. Belgian Viscount and current Bilderberg chairman Etienne Davignon told the EU Observer in 2009 that the next Bilderberg meeting could improve understanding on future action in the same way it helped create the Euro in the 1990s. This illustrates the patience, vision, and reach of this organization. It was able to promote and establish both the European Union and a European currency over the course of just under 40 years, incrementally. One of the things that the um, elitists discussed back at the turn of the century when they were talking about how do you convert the United States into a collectivist system was the fact that you can't do it quickly. You have to let people get used to it incrementally because any major change would be rejected. The 1957 Conference of Rome, where the Common Market Treaty, providing for free trade in all products, was at last signed. Six nations, France, Germany, Italy, Belgium, Holland, and Luxembourg, agreed to remove all mutual barriers to trade within 12 to 15 years, the embryo of a political union which they proclaimed to be their ultimate objective. In that fashion, it's possible for people to get used to this process and even to think it's a good thing. People will accept uh, the gradual uh, growth of government, the gradual loss of their purchasing power. Uh, they'll accept almost anything if it's done gradually. And we have to be very alert to that. 2008 and 2009 attendees include World Bank President Robert Zolik, Treasury Secretary Timothy Geithner, former head of British Secret Intelligence Richard Dearlove, Donald Graham, CEO of the Washington Post, CNN host and author of The Post-American World, Fareed Zakaria, and many other giants of business, politics, and media. You just came back 
from meeting with the Bilderberg Group. The Bilderberg Group are, you know, I, when, when people who are conspiracy theory, theory people, I, they send me mail. It's usually about the Bilderberg Group. And I get these books in my front door, which I'm uncomfortable with. But, and it's all about the Bilderberg Group, like they're the modern-day Illuminati. Are you a member of the Bilderberg Group? Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't think we're supposed to talk about this. Many have identified them as the kingmakers, the puppet masters that pulled the strings behind the scenes. Perhaps there is no better example of this than what occurred during the 2008 conference. Immediately after Obama had been selected as the Democratic presidential nominee,